The Mysteries of Udolpho by Anne Radcliffe. Reading and musical performances by Cara Dahl Russell. Volume 2, Chapter 1. Quote, Where'er I roam, whatever realms I see, my heart untraveled still shall turn to thee. Unquote. Goldsmith. The carriages were at the gates at an early hour. The bustle of domestics passing to and fro in the galleries awakened Emily from harassing slumbers. Her unquiet mind had, during the night, presented her with terrific images and obscure circumstances concerning her affection and her future life. She now endeavored to chase away the impressions they had left on her fancy, but from imaginary evils she awoke to the consciousness of real ones. Recollecting that she had parted with Valancourt perhaps forever, her heart sickened as memory revived. But she tried to dismiss the dismal forebodings that crowded on her mind, and to restrain the sorrow which she could not subdue, efforts which diffused over the settled melancholy of her countenance an expression of tempered resignation, as a thin veil thrown over the features of beauty renders them more interesting by a partial concealment. But Madame Montoni observed nothing in this countenance except its usual paleness, which attracted her censure. She told her niece that she had been indulging in fanciful sorrows, and begged she would have more regard for decorum than to let the world see that she could not renounce an improper attachment, at which Emily's pale cheek became flushed with crimson, but it was the blush of pride, and she made no answer. Soon after, Montoni entered the breakfast room, spoke little, and seemed impatient to be gone. The windows of this room opened upon the garden, and as Emily passed them, she saw the spot where she had parted with Valancourt on the preceding night. The remembrance pressed heavily on her heart, and she turned hastily away from the object that had awakened it. The baggage being at length adjusted, the travellers entered their carriages, and Emily would have left the chateau without one sigh of regret had it not been situated in the neighbourhood of Valancourt's residence. From a little eminence she looked back upon Toulouse, and the far-seen plains of Gascony, beyond which the broken summits of the Pyrenees appeared on the distant horizon, lighted up by a morning sun. Dear pleasant mountains, said she to herself, how long may it be ere I see ye again, and how much may happen to make me miserable in the interval? Oh, could I now be certain that I should ever return to ye, and find that Valancourt still lived for me, I should go in peace. He will still gaze on ye, gaze when I am far away." The trees that impended over the high banks of the road and formed a line of perspective with the distant country now threatened to exclude the view of them, but the bluish mountains still appeared beyond the dark foliage, and Emily continued to lean from the coach window till at length the closing branches shut them from her sight. Another object soon caught her attention. She had scarcely looked at a person who walked along the bank with his hat, in which was the military feather drawn over his eyes, before, at the sound of the wheels, he suddenly turned, and she perceived that it was Valancourt himself, who waved his hand, sprung into the road, and through the window of the carriage put a letter into her hand. He endeavoured to smile through the despair that o'erspread his countenance as she passed on. The remembrance of that smile seemed impressed on Emily's mind forever. 
She leaned from the window and saw him on a knoll of the broken bank, leaning against the high trees that waved over him and pursuing the carriage with his eyes. He waved his hand, and she continued to gaze till distance confused his figure, and at length another turn of the road entirely separated him from her sight. Having stopped to take up Signor Cavigny at a chateau on the road, the travellers, of whom Emily was disrespectfully seated with Madame Montoni's woman in the second carriage, pursued their way over the plains of Languedoc. The presence of this servant restrained Emily from reading Valancourt's letter, for she did not choose to expose the emotions it might occasion to the observation of any person. Yet such was her wish to read this, his last communication, that her trembling hand was every moment on the point of breaking the seal. At length they reached the village, where they stayed only to change horses without alighting, and it was not till they stopped to dine that Emily had an opportunity of reading the letter. Though she had never doubted the sincerity of Valancourt's affection, the fresh assurances she now received of it revived her spirits. She wept over his letter in tenderness, laid it by to be referred to when they should be particularly depressed, and then thought of him with much less anguish than she had done since they parted. Among some other requests, which were interesting to her because expressive of his tenderness, and because a compliance with them seemed to annihilate for a while the pain of absence, he entreated she would always think of him at sunset. "'You will then meet me in thought,' said he. "'I shall constantly watch the sunset, and I shall be happy in the belief that your eyes are fixed upon the same object with mine, and that our minds are conversing. You know not, Emily, the comfort I promise myself from these moments, but I trust you will experience it. It is unnecessary to say with what emotion Emily on this evening watched the declining sun over a long extent of plains on which she saw it set without interruption and sink towards the province which Valancourt inhabited. After this hour, her mind became far more tranquil and resigned than it had been since the marriage of Montoni and her aunt. During several days, the travellers journeyed over the plains of Languedoc, and then entering Dauphiny, and winding for some time among the mountains of that romantic province, they quitted their carriages and began to ascend the Alps and here such scenes of sublimity opened upon them as no colors of language must dare to paint. Emily's mind was even so much engaged with new and wonderful images that they sometimes banished the idea of Valancourt, though they more frequently revived it. These brought to her recollection the prospects among the Pyrenees which they had admired together and had believed nothing could excel in grandeur. How often did she wish to express to him the new emotions which this astonishing scenery awakened, and that he could partake of them. Sometimes, too, she endeavored to anticipate his remarks and almost imagined him present. She seemed to have arisen into another world and to have left every trifling thought, every trifling sentiment in that below, those only of grandeur and sublimity now dilated her mind and elevated the affections of her heart. With what emotions of sublimity, softened by tenderness, did she meet Valancourt in thought at the customary hour of sunset, 
when, wandering among the Alps, she watched the glorious orb sink amid their summits, his last tints die away on their snowy points, and a solemn obscurity steal over the scene. And when the last gleam had faded, she turned her eyes from the west with somewhat of the melancholy regret that is experienced after the departure of a beloved friend. While these lonely feelings were heightened by the spreading gloom and by the low sounds heard only when darkness confines attention, which make the general stillness more impressive, leaves shook by the air the last sigh of the breeze that lingers after sunset or the murmur of distant streams. During the first days of this journey among the Alps, the scenery exhibited a wonderful mixture of solitude and inhabitation, of cultivation and barrenness. On the edge of tremendous precipices and within the hollow of the cliffs, below which the clouds often floated, were seen villages, spires, and convent towers. While green pastures and vineyards spread their hues at the feet of perpendicular rocks of marble or of granite, whose points, tufted with alpine shrubs, or exhibiting only mossy crags, rose above each other, till they terminated in the snow-topped mountain, whence the torrent fell, that thundered along the valley. The snow was not yet melted on the summit of Mount Sinis, over which the travellers passed, but Emily, as she looked upon its clear lake and extended plain, surrounded by broken cliffs, saw, in imagination, the verdant beauty it would exhibit when the snows should be gone, and the shepherds, leading up the midsummer flocks from Piedmont to pasture on its flowery summit, should add Arcadian figures to Arcadian landscape. As she descended on the Italian side, the precipices became still more tremendous, and the prospects still more wild and majestic, over which the shifting lights threw all the pomp of colouring. Emily delighted to observe the snowy tops of the mountains under the passing influence of the day, blushing with morning, glowing with the brightness of noon, or just tinted with the purple evening. The haunt of man could now only be discovered by the simple hut of the shepherd and the hunter, or by the rough pine bridge thrown across the torrent, to assist the latter in his chase of the chamois over the crags, where, but for this vestige of man, it would have been believed only the chamois or the wolf dared to venture. As Emily gazed upon one of these perilous bridges, with the cataract foaming beneath it, some images came to her mind, which she afterwards combined in the following storied sonnet. Quote, the weary traveller, who all night long has climbed among the Alps' tremendous steeps, skirting the pathless precipice, where throng the wild forms of danger, as he onward creeps, if chance his anxious eye at distance sees the mountain shepherd's solitary home, peeping from forth the moon-illumined trees, what sudden transports to his bosom come. But, if between some hideous chasm yawn where the cleft pine of a doubtful bridge displays in dreadful silence on the brink, forlorn he stands and views in the faint rays far, far below the torrent's rising surge, and listens to the wild, impetuous roar, still eyes the depth, still shudders on the verge, fears to return, nor dares to venture o'er. Desperate, 
At length the tottering plank he tries, his weak steps slide, he shrieks, he sinks, he dies. End quote. Often as she traveled among the clouds, watched in silent awe their billowing surges rolling below. Sometimes, wholly closing upon the scene, they appeared like a world of chaos. And at others, spreading thinly, they opened and admitted partial catches of the landscape. The torrent, whose astounding roar had never failed, tumbling down the rocky chasm, huge cliffs white with snow, or the dark summits of the pine forest that stretched midway down the mountains. But who may describe her rapture when, having passed through a sea of vapor, she caught a first view of Italy? When, from the ridge of one of those tremendous precipices that hang upon Mount Sinise and guard the entrance of that enchanting country, she looked down through the lower clouds and, as they floated away, saw the grassy vales of Piedmont at her feet and beyond, the plains of Lombardy extending to the farthest distance at which appeared, on the faint horizon, the doubtful towers of Turin. the solitary grandeur of the objects that immediately surrounded her, the mountain region towering above, the deep precipices that fell beneath, the waving blackness of the forest of pine and oak which skirted their feet or hung within their recesses, the headlong torrents that, dashing among the cliffs, sometimes appeared like a cloud of mist, at others like a sheet of ice. These were features which received a higher character of sublimity from the reposing beauty of the Italian landscape below, stretching to the wide horizon, where the same melting blue tint seemed to unite earth and sky. Madame Montoni only shuddered as she looked down precipices near whose edge the chairman trotted lightly and swiftly, almost as the chamois bounded, and from which Emily too recoiled. But with her fears were mingled such various emotions of delight, such admiration, astonishment, and awe as she had never experienced before. Meanwhile, the carriers, having come to a landing place, stopped to rest and the travellers being seated on the point of a cliff, Montoni and Cavigni renewed a dispute concerning Hannibal's passage over the Alps, Montoni contending that he entered Italy by way of Mount Cenis, and Cavigni that he passed over Mount St. Bernard. The subject brought to Emily's imagination the disasters he had suffered in this bold and perilous adventure. She saw his vast armies winding among the defiles and over the tremendous cliffs of the mountains, which at night were lighted up by fires, or by the torches which he caused to be carried when he pursued his indefatigable march. In the eye of fancy, she perceived the gleam of arms through the duskiness of night, the glitter of spears and helmets, and the banners floating dimly on the twilight, while now and then the blast of a distant trumpet echoed along the defile, and the signal was answered by a momentary clash of arms. She looked with horror upon the mountaineers, perched on the higher cliffs, assailing the troops below with broken fragments of the mountain, on soldiers and elephants tumbling headlong down the lower precipices, and, as she listened to the rebounding rocks that followed their fall, the terrors of fancy yielded to those of reality, 
and she shuddered to behold herself on the dizzy height whence she had pictured the descent of others. Madame Montoni, meantime, as she looked upon Italy, was contemplating in imagination the splendor of palaces and the grandeur of castles, such as she believed she was going to be mistress of at Venice and in the Apennine, and she became an idea little less than a princess. Being no longer under the alarms which had deterred her from giving entertainments to the beauties of Toulouse, whom Montoni had mentioned with more eclat to his own vanity than credit to their discretion, or regard to truth, she determined to give concerts, though she had neither ear nor taste for music, conversazioni, though she had no talents for conversation, and to outvie, if possible, in the gaieties of her parties and the magnificence of her liveries, all the noblesse of Venice. This blissful reverie was somewhat obscured when she recollected the seigneur, her husband, who, though he was not averse to the profit which sometimes results from such parties, had always shown a contempt of the frivolous parade that sometimes attends them, till she considered that his pride might be gratified by displaying among his own friends in his native city the wealth which he had neglected in France, and she courted again the splendid illusions that had charmed her before. The travellers, as they descended, gradually exchanged the region of winter for the genial warmth and beauty of spring. The sky began to assume that serene and beautiful tint peculiar to the climate of Italy. Patches of young verdure, fragrant shrubs and flowers looked gaily among the rocks, often fringing their rugged brows or hanging in tufts from their broken sides and the buds of the oak and mountain ash were expanding into foliage. Descending lower, the orange and the myrtle every now and then appeared in some sunny nook, with their yellow blossoms peeping from among the dark green of the leaves and mingling with the scarlet flowers of the pomegranate and the paler ones of the arbutus that ran mantling to the crags above, while, lower still, spread the pastures of Piedmont, where early flocks were cropping the luxuriant herbage of spring. The river Doria, which, rising on the summit of Mount Cenis, had dashed for many leagues over the precipices that bordered the road, now began to assume a less impetuous, though scarcely less romantic, character as it approached the green valleys of Piedmont, into which the travellers descended with the evening sun, and Emily found herself once more amid the tranquil beauty of pastoral scenery, among flocks and herds, and slopes tufted with woods of lively verdure and with beautiful shrubs, such as she had often seen waving luxuriantly over the Alps above. The verdure of the pasturage, now varied with the hues of early flowers, among which were yellow ranunculuses and pansy violets of delicious fragrance, she had never seen excelled. Emily almost wished to become a peasant of Piedmont, to inhabit one of the pleasant embowered cottages which she saw peeping beneath the cliffs, and to pass her careless hours among these romantic landscapes. To the hours, the months, she was to pass under the dominion of Montoni, she looked with apprehension, while those which were departed she remembered with regret and sorrow.
In the present scenes, her fancy often gave her the figure of Valancourt, whom she saw on a point of the cliffs, gazing with awe and admiration on the scenery around him, or wandering pensively along the vale below, frequently pausing to look back upon the scenery, and then his countenance glowing with the poet's fire, pursuing his way to some overhanging heights. When she again considered the time and distance that were to separate them, that every step she took now lengthened this distance, her heart sank, and the surrounding landscape charmed her no more. The travellers, passing Novalesa, reached, after the evening had closed, the small and ancient town of Susa, which had formerly guarded the pass of the Alps into Piedmont. The heights which command it had, since the invention of artillery, rendered its fortifications useless, but these romantic heights, seen by moonlight with the town below, surrounded by walls and watchtowers and partially illumined, exhibited an interesting picture to Emily. Here they rested for the night at an inn, which had little accommodation to boast of, but the travellers brought with them the hunger that gives delicious flavour to the coarsest viands, and the weariness that ensures repose. And here Emily first caught a strain of Italian music on Italian ground. <laughs> supper at a little window that opened upon the country, observing an effect of the moonlight on the broken surface of the mountains, and remembering that on such a night as this she once had sat with her father and Valancourt resting upon a cliff of the Pyrenees. She heard from below the long-drawn sounds of a violin of such tone and delicacy of expression as harmonized exactly with the tender emotions she was indulging, and both charmed and surprised her. Gavigny, who approached the window, smiled at her surprise. "'This is nothing extraordinary,' said he. "'You'll hear the same, perhaps, at every inn on our way. "'It is one of our landlord's family who plays, I doubt not.' Emily, as she listened, thought he could be scarcely less than a professor of music whom she heard, and the sweet and plaintive strains soon lulled her into a reverie, from which she was very unwillingly roused by the raillery of Cavigny and by the voice of Montoni, who gave orders to a servant 
to have the carriages ready at an early hour on the following morning, and added that he meant to dine at Turin. Madame Montoni was exceedingly rejoiced to be once more on level ground, and after giving a long detail of the various terrors she had suffered, which she forgot that she was describing to the companions of her dangers, she added a hope that she would soon be beyond the view of these horrid mountains, which all the world, said she, should not tempt me to cross again. Complaining of fatigue, she soon retired to rest, and Emily withdrew to her room. When she understood from Annette, her aunt's woman, that Cavigny was nearly right in his conjecture concerning the musician, who had awakened the violin with so much taste, for that he was the son of a peasant inhabiting the neighboring valley. He is going to the carnival at Venice, added Annette, for they say he has a fine hand at playing, and will get a world of money, and the carnival is going to begin. But for my part, I should like to live among these pleasant woods and hills, better than in a town, and they say, mademoiselle, we shall see no woods or hills, or fields at Venice, for that it is built in the very middle of the sea. Emily agreed with the talkative Annette that this young man was making a change for the worse, and could not forbear silently lamenting that he should be drawn from the innocence and beauty of these scenes to the corrupt ones of that voluptuous city. When she was alone, unable to sleep, the landscapes of her native home, with Valancourt and the circumstances of her departure, haunted her fancy. She drew pictures of social happiness amidst the grand simplicity of nature, such as she feared she had bade farewell to forever. And then the idea of this young Piedmontese, thus ignorantly sporting with his happiness, returned to her thoughts, and glad to escape a while from the pressure of nearer interests, she indulged her fancy in composing these following lines. The Piedmontese Quote, Ah, merry swain, who laughed along the vales, and with your gay pipe made the mountains ring, why leave your cot, your woods, and timey gales, and friends beloved, for aught that wealth can bring? He goes to wake, o'er the moonlight sees the string Venetian gold his untaught fancy hails. Yet oft of home his simple carols sing, and his steps pause as the last alp he sees. Once more he turns to view his native scene. Far, far below, as roll the clouds away, he spies his cabin mid the pine tops green, the well-known woods, clear brook, and pastures gay, and thinks of friends and parents left behind, of sylvan revels, dance, and festive song, and hears the faint reed swelling in the wind, and his sad sighs the distant notes prolong. Thus went the swain, till mountain shadows fell and dimmed the landscape to his aching sight, and must he leave the vales he loves so well. Can foreign wealth and shows his heart delight? No happy vales. Your wild rocks shall still hear his pipe, light sounding on the morning breeze. Still shall he lead the flocks to streamlet clear, and watch at eve beneath the western trees. Away, Venetian gold, your charm is o'er. And now his swift step seeks the lowland bowers, where, through the leaves, his cottage light once more guides him to happy friends and jocund hours. Ah, merry swain, that laugh among the vales, and with your gay pipe make the mountains ring, your cot your woods, your thymy scented gales, and friends beloved, more joy than wealth can bring. End quote.
end of Volume 2, Chapter 1. Reading and musical selections performed by Cara Dahl Russell. If you'd like to support this and other readings on Reading Rest Period, you can make a donation directly at paypal.me backslash Russell. Thank you.